old Father Thames, London's romantic image of its water highway. But rolling down to the mighty sea, the problem is the mighty sea rolling up the Thames. In 1238, for instance, it was recorded the Palace of Westminster was flooded and the boatmen did row their wherries through the Great Hall. The history of Thames flooding goes back even further. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle said in 1099, on the festival of St. Martin, the flood sprang up to such a height and did so much harm as no man remembered. In 1928, the floods in central London that cost 14 lives prompted an MP, Sir Alan Herbert, to say in Parliament, we have brought the sea into the city and have not got any means of keeping it out. History will repeat itself. It is no longer a case of if, but when the Thames will flood again. No, but there nearly was. There was a very bad one in 1928 when 14 people were drowned. And of course the 1953 flood that we've been talking about in school. These children have come from Thamesmead in London, a low-lying area close to the river. They have chosen as a classroom project a subject which is important to them and to the millions who live or work in London the River Thames and its new flood defences. All right. Now up here, where the North Atlantic runs into the North Sea, low air pressure gives us gale force winds. And when a high tide is due at the same time, the water surges down here like in a funnel. There's the funnel. <laughs> exactly. The southeast part of England gets closer to Holland, Belgium and northern France. So down comes the water, millions of tons of it, rushes up the Thames, and there's poor old London, drowned if we don't do something about it. So that's why you're building the barrier? Exactly. Now let's go back in there and have a look at the project as it should be when it's finished. Right then. Well, most of you know by now what the project's going to look like when it's finished, but for the benefit of the newcomers, here it is. A barrier of gates stretching from Silvertown across the Woolwich Reach, a nice straight section of the Thames. And this is how it works. The main gates are supported by these piers and lying concrete sills down in the riverbed until they're needed. Then they are swung up through the water to form a dam and hold back a surge tide. The piers will be built upwards from the riverbed and made of concrete. To allow shipping to pass, we build in stages. First the south side piers, then the north. But while building the southern piers, we'll also build the sill units in a large dry dock over here, on the north side. Now, is there anything you can show me? Here's my drawing. Oh yes, well that's a very early stage. That's putting in the piling for a coffer dam. The building of the coffer dam, forming the dry dock, was some of the earliest work on the barrier which started towards the end of 1974. It was just the beginning of the major part of an imaginative plan to hold back a surge tide and prevent a major disaster along the tidal Thames. The Greater London Council is responsible for the barrier and with the downstream water authorities for raising the banks. The whole project is financially assisted by the Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries and Food whilst the civil engineering work is being carried out by CTH, a joint venture by Coston Civil Engineering, Tarmac Construction and HBM from Holland. From the south bank, a jetty was built. This was to provide access for plant and machinery, to move and handle equipment and materials, particularly the thousands of tons of steel piles needed for the platforms and coffer dams of the first four piers. Pile driving continued for nearly two years to build supports for the working platforms of the piers and to form those coffer dams, the temporary watertight structures in which the piers would be built. The piles had to be driven deep into the hard chalk below the riverbed. At times, a blow from the 20-ton piling hammer achieved movement of only half a millimetre. When it came to driving special piles for the protection fender, a piece of technology was borrowed from the oil men, the hydroblock piling hammer, developed to build rigs in the North Sea. 
this fender marked the side of the navigation channel, allowing construction to proceed and river traffic to pass safely through. The pier cofferdams needed additional protection, provided by circles of sheet piles filled with ballast and known as dolphins. The largest crane on the river, the Port of London Authority's Samson, was essential for rapidly moving heavy equipment from one pier to the next. This type of piling rig has seldom been used in Britain, but on the barrier, two were in constant use. A highlight of the school children's project their visit to the barrier site. Where is the first pier going to be built? The pier you see over there, which we call Pier 9, this is the first pier that will be built. I should think the actual main pour of the concrete will probably start in about four to six weeks' time. Class 3 of Windrush Primary School, there was a chance to capture on paper the early construction of the precast sills and to find out just what they were for. Even though the sills will spend most of their life unseen beneath the water, they are accurately built cellular structures up to 61 meters long, designed to house and protect the gates. The children understood that the sills were being built in a dry dock because construction between the piers in the river itself would have severely restricted the tidal flow. Built into the sills and linked with the piers by rubber joints are subways to carry water, power and fuel lines and personnel. When the barrier is finished, these tunnels will provide access right across the river. The scallop shape of the sill is critical, for it has to accept one of the six rising sector steel gates. The consulting engineers, Randall Palmer and Tritton, who designed the barrier, specified reinforcement and pre-stressing to give the sills enough strength to span between the piers. Each sill has to become, for a short time, a precision-built concrete barge, its ends sealed by steel bulkheads, so that it can be floated out of the dry dock. While the dry dock was flooded, it was ballasted with water until the day of the tow-out. When pumped dry, it rose with the tide to be towed to storage until the piers were ready for it to be placed in position. the first four sills towed out, the dry dock was pumped dry and cleaned out. The final two sills could then be built. But now there was also room to build the north abutment and the two adjacent piers. So pile driving began and the next stage was underway. Thank you. 
Meanwhile, class three were also making headway. Look this way, everyone, please. Stop what you're doing. You'll all remember our friend, Mr. Newark, from the barrier site. Well, he's come along today to see how far we've got with our project. Morning, children. Good morning, sir. Well, down on the real barrier, we're progressing very nicely, but you seem to have come to the end of yours. Now then. Well, I saw some of your early attempts at making models of piers, but this one's really something, isn't it? What have you made that of? Concrete. It's actually made of concrete, is it? Oh, that's very good. Right, now the gate's in the down position. Can you show it to me? Does it work? Yes. Well, can you show it to me in the up position? The fence position. This is the defense position. Fine. And now in the maintenance position. That is the maintenance position. That's it. Very good. Now, can you put it back in the defense position? That's it. And can you show me the water levels now? That's fine. Now, this part of the river is... Down river. Down river. And this part is... Uh, uh. Up river. Exactly. Now, you realise, of course, that these gates weigh between 3,000 and 4,000 tonnes. Yes. And do you know how long it takes to get from the open position to the defence position? Yes, we looked it up, 15 minutes. 15 minutes, about that, approximately 15 minutes, that's very good. Of course, the real thing was a somewhat bigger proposition. In fact, one of the biggest movable barriers in the world. And it needed some of the largest and most sophisticated equipment, often specially developed for CTH. Nowhere was the scale of the task more apparent than in the piling and excavation of pier coffer dams. Piles nearly 40 metres in length were driven deep into the chalk. Steel walls forming a coffer dam in which a pier could then be built. Excavation of the soft riverbed was by conventional grabs. The chalk, however, presented more of a challenge. Auger drills with pumps, hydrojets, airlifts, and even explosives were needed to reduce the level inside the coffer dam. Pressure on the surrounding steel walls would have been too great with the coffer dam pumped dry so excavation had to be carried out underwater. The excavated material was deposited in barges and carried downriver to the estuary. The Thames Barrier Project has brought with it a unique set of problems. Not least among them, that stubborn chalk beneath the riverbed. And to overcome the problem, this specially modified rock drill. One of the methods adopted to drive the broken chalk and water up to the surface was by airlift, which required enormous quantities of compressed air. Before the coffer dam could be pumped out, the chalk base had to be sealed against the high groundwater pressures deep beneath the riverbed. Round the clock for four or five days, concrete was pumped continuously, making the seal and forming the foundation for a pier. Concrete with a delayed set was used to ensure an unjointed slab. The pouring started at one end, and in stages, the level was raised to five meters. In fact, over six and a half thousand cubic meters were placed in this way for Pier 5 alone. And 
And now, with the foundations ready, the coffer dam could safely be pumped dry. One of the largest coffer dams ever built. It would take over 400 double-decker buses to fill it, and yet it's just one of eight built for the Thames barrier. With the clearing up completed, pier construction could at long last get underway. Traditional methods were used to place formwork, reinforcement and concrete in one and a half meter layers to a height of over 35 meters. There were nine piers to be built, eight in their own coffer dams. Even working three shifts and pumping concrete night and day, each pier took between nine months and a year to build. Despite weighing up to 155 tons, the gate support structures were lowered into position to an accuracy of two millimeters. Engineers and foremen, crane drivers and installation specialists worked closely together. There was no margin for trial and error. Once positioned, each unit was bonded into the pier itself with steel reinforcement. The timber form work was of a high standard to give a smooth finish with no surfaces vulnerable to water flow. The shapes distinctive, yet essentially functional, would become landmarks to river traffic and river bank strollers. But it's here, at the bottom, that the precise measurements and accuracy really count. The piers must be exactly located and the sills precisely aligned to house the gates. At the base of each pier is an adjustable support to ensure that the sill unit will be level. Before the coffer dam surrounding a pier could be removed, each pile had to be cut with a thermic lance below the riverbed. The machinery used to place the piles had been powerful, but it needed even more power to extract them. With southern pier construction completed, the navigation channel was switched so that work could begin on the remaining northern piers. Already Pier 9 looked impressive, but there was still much to be done before the gates could be installed and the stainless steel shell roofs erected over the machinery rooms. On the north bank, inside the temporary dry dock, Work was well underway on piers one and two with their connecting sills, all of which could be built in place without interfering with the river flow. A model that would turn class three green with envy. But this one, at the University of Delft in Holland, had an important role to play helping to design the control system for placing a 10,000 ton sill unit while coping with the ebb and flow of the tide, probably the most complex operation of all. A trench had to be dug in the riverbed before a sill could be placed. Again, specialist equipment was brought to bear. Popeye, a pontoon mounted dredger with all the muscle of his cartoon namesake and capable of removing hard chalk from a depth of 25 meters.
Now, all was ready for the sinking of a sill. Quite often on the barrier, a point of no return was reached, and an operation just had to continue, in spite of the weather. This sill placing, for example, started in bright sunshine on a Saturday, but by the time it was winched into position on Sunday, it was covered by a mantle of fog. Before the sill scallop was finally flooded, the lowering jacks were connected and a diver completed underwater checks. Just one of many diving operations necessary during construction. It was a tense moment but with skilled hands at the controls, the massive unit was gradually lowered through the murky waters to the river bottom. The river bed had then to be strengthened to prevent erosion or scouring caused by swirling currents during gate operation. It was another job for Popeye, removing silt before placing a woven polypropylene mattress, not unlike the reed and willow damp protectors used in ancient times. Once in position, they were weighted with a layer of small stones. Larger rocks were then placed on top, using a clamshell grab. Skillfully, the operators formed a new strengthened riverbed, virtually stone by stone. But by now, class three had finished their barrier. Oh, there it is, finished. Your model of our barrier. Now, oh, you've got it all there, the gates and the piers. And what are these called? Walkways. Walkways. Yes, that's right. Now this part of the river is... Stanley. And this part is... Uh, now one of these gates moves, doesn't it? Yes, I'll show you. Oh, that's splendid. Very good. Now you've all done so well, and I've got a surprise for you. Now the company I work for have been so excited by the way you've handled this project, and I'm sure it's been exciting for you as well, that they thought you might like this equipment so that you had the opportunity of making some movies of your own on this and future projects. And thank you very much. I've enjoyed thank it very much. You. Well, we've enjoyed it very much, haven't we? It's been hard work, but we have enjoyed it too. <laughs> thank you very much. Hard work too on the full-scale project. But by mid-1980, most of the major civil engineering work had been completed. The foundations of the final mid-river piers were finished, and piers 7, 8 and 9 capped with their shining shell roofs. Installation of the gates and operating machinery by the Davy Cleveland Barrier Consortium will soon begin. The last pieces of this vast engineering jigsaw. When operational, the barrier will stand as a unique and awesome feat of engineering. To the people of London, the threat of floods will then be just a memory. The barrier will be taming old Father Thames. Thank you.